for joining us. Let us just record. All right. So, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. I uh, feel very lucky. I get to talk about one of my favorite things I get to do. And my name is Haley Mills. I am a security engineer for a uh, financial technology firm. Um, but I also do cybersecurity education and mentoring on the side. Um, you can see my website at the bottom there, seventhdirection.com, because uh, sort of my the, the seventh direction is you've got north, south, east, west, up, and down. So the last place you can go is inward. And uh, yeah, something I tell my students all the time is that uh, you are your teacher. I say that just because I think there's a perception that, um, you know, when you go into a class that, you know, the teacher has the knowledge in their brain and they're going to like somehow transfer it to you. And to some degree, I think that's true, but I like the idea of us being like our own teacher in the sense that, you know, you're going to learn it differently from the teacher you're going to have to sort of like problem solve and critical think in your own way and and it's great that there are different ways to solve problems so uh i hopefully by the end of this you you think of some questions that maybe you'd like answers to and i can help with that and uh you know you can find out what learning works for you so uh we're gonna go over a few things today um i've got three listed here and i've got a bonus one at the end so the firstly, we're going to go over security principles, which are just general ways we think about security and how we approach it so that at an enterprise level, we're constantly getting better at it. Uh, then I'll go over a little bit some of the tools and departments because the, uh, the enterprise portion of this uh, cybersecurity and incident response, enterprise just means pretty much large corporation or business. Uh, so, you know, you can have 10,000 employees, 100,000 employees in one company. So how do you properly defend that? And that sort of works the same at, at, at the big scale. You just have more people doing it. Uh, and then we'll talk about security operations itself, some of the tools we use. And uh, the bonus at the end is, uh, if we have time, is to talk about some of the sort of like recent attacks or just like recent stories in cybersecurity news. Because something about this job is that you have to stay plugged in to what's happening on the forefront of security because as soon as it's the forefront of security, you have to start defending it. There, there isn't uh, much lag time between when something bad gets figured out and then attackers utilizing it at scale across the entire internet all over the world. So hopefully we'll be able to make it to uh, talk about those three things. So the first set of security principles I wanted to go over starts with the CIA triad. And that is not the Central Intelligence Agency, although they are absolutely certainly using these three principles in the way they structure their operations. But the first one, the C is for confidentiality. And, you know, this, this has been codified. I think the CIA triad came about during like the early intelligence agencies after World War I than before World War II, um, but these types of principles have been in use since the beginning of, well, not the dawn of time, but definitely when people started warring with each other and wanted to keep secrets from each other, and how do we do that? So this goes back to Sun Tzu's Art of War, goes back to Julius Caesar, and the confidentiality, an example I like to use is um, Caesar utilized this cipher, which just means like a way to encrypt or encode text in a way that if it got intercepted, you wouldn't be able to translate it. So Caesar has a cipher called the Caesar cipher. And basically it's just rotating each letter 13 uh, letters down the alphabet. So A becomes, I think M, B becomes N, C becomes O and so on and so forth. So that if someone got opened a message that Caesar didn't want someone to read, they would think it's gibberish. And I mean, granted that's not a super complex scheme, but if someone just sees it's gibberish, they don't think too much about it or can't crack it for whatever reason, then the message stays confidential. So we have a lot of ways of causing confidentiality in our environment. And that's definitely one of the aims of security is to increase confidentiality as much as possible. The next one I have up is integrity. 
And this is to ensure that the message has stayed the same. We want to be able to make sure things haven't been tampered with. So uh, to take a sort of example from history, if you've seen a movie where like a letter gets sealed with the, the wax seal of the king, like they have a ring that seals onto some hot wax so that the idea is when the letter is received at the other end, it's got the seal of the king. And that supposedly shows that the letter hasn't been tampered with in transit. So in computers, we have, for example, file hashes, which are one way encryption algorithms and one way meaning like you can encrypt a file and generate a hash. But if you have a gener if you have a hash, you cannot generate the file. Um, they're very different. So uh, we have something uh, we use MD5 hashes or SHA-128 or SHA-256 hashes to verify that a file has stayed the same. Or, for example, um, if someone is doing forensics to submit to like a criminal case, like if someone has data on their computer and they've done something terrible, then investors, investigators have to take a hash of the hard drive to prove that all of the evidence they found on that hard drive, they haven't tampered with the hard drive at all because the hash should stay the same. Um, you know, there shouldn't be any editing, so they couldn't plant evidence, for example. And uh, lastly, the A in CIA is for availability. And this one's interesting because you have to balance availability with these two other concepts uh, in the sense that you don't want your data so confidential and so, the integrity so maintained that you could never use it for, for whatever you want to use it. So, I mean, a simple example of this is a, is a key and a lock, you know, like you can make a, cop, a few copies of that key so the right people have it. Um, but then also you're risking confidentiality and integrity and if, in case someone uh, who shouldn't have the key gets the key. So in security, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to balance these two or these three principles and uh, sort of layer our defenses in a way that uh, prevents tampering or misuse. So to go a little bit further on that front, uh, next up we have defense in depth. And so the idea here is, is that if an attacker gets past this thing, then we don't want them to get past this thing. And so if we have defenses at every layer, we, we have an extra chance of catching them. So like, you know, in, in, in the heist movie, when the, the criminals come up uh, to the vault, there's like the laser uh, grid. And of course, one of them knows like acrobatics and can just do a fancy dance through the laser. Um, but but each one of those defenses, you know, is, a, is another opportunity to catch them. And so we do the same thing with cybersecurity. So I have two listed here that you may be familiar with. Um, traditional antivirus, which used to just work on hashes, like it used to be like a library of hashes, like, oh, if you see this file, it's bad. But now it's getting a little more complex where it's like, well, if you see it calling the, the DLL file that monitors your keystrokes, like why is it monitoring keystrokes? Uh, and that sort of thing. So, so there are additional defenses beyond just the hash. And so there's things they watch out for. Um, the firewall, uh, if you're not familiar, is so you've got a firewall on your home router at home. And the firewall can have rules about what traffic it allows out and what traffic it allows in. So for example, your router has a rule that if anything pings it from outside from the internet and like is like, hey, I want to talk to something inside deny it altogether because you don't want just anyone on the internet to like hit your IP address and just start looking inside your network. So you have an implicit deny at the router. And so your router is only letting things out from inside your network out to the internet. Um, so you can, you can layer firewall rules in interesting ways to uh, increase security, but those are two really common um, sets of defenses we have. But we can talk about a few more. We've got identity and access management, which you may not be familiar as familiar with if not in like a business environment where you're getting issued a name and a password. But it's not just a name and password because I'm sure you have those on your computer at home or services that you log into, log into. But also a business can manage access. So that means that you know, your account is only given privileges to do this. Like if you're in HR, 
you're not getting access to the IT equipment. If you're in IT, you're not getting access to HR records. Um, and the idea is also you don't want your IT admin that has lots of privileges to just be able to log in on their regular account and browse the internet and install software and change uh, security architecture. You wanna separate out those accounts. So they have one account for like logging in an email and another account for doing uh, you know, actual changes. Um, another thing we've got is data loss prevention. So this is monitoring files so you can track where they go. So for example, if there are HR records or accounting records, let's say, you would want to monitor when the accounting records are moved and transferred. So you could monitor when it's being transferred to a USB drive if someone's trying to exfiltrate it that way, or you could monitor it's being transferred over the internet or it's been zipped up and added to a zip. Now start looking at that zip and see where that zip goes so that when there's some sort of exfiltration, you can track the fingerprints of where that file came from and hopefully figure out what compromised your system. Next up is an intrusion detection system. So there's two really common ones called Suricata and Snort that are open source. You can install this, run it on your home network and watch you know, interesting patterns of activity. So it's just looking for suspicious patterns in network traffic. So they have thousands and thousands of the rules for this thing, but you might, for example, want to see any traffic that's going to a domain like .ru or .cn for Russia or China. Like why, why is someone on your network going to a Russian or Chinese site? And obviously that there's plenty of ways to get around this and make it not as obvious to your IDS. But again, it's just layers of defense and the IDS is looking at network traffic, looking for suspicious things it can find. And then lastly is my favorite one is endpoint detection and response. So this overlaps with antivirus a little bit, but what I would say it's doing is it's monitoring what every single process on your machine is doing. And if you're not super familiar with what a process is, when you press control alt delete when something is hung and like is frozen, or you press control shift escape, it brings up the task manager directly. And each one of these is a process. So I have Adobe Photoshop running and it's got this file open. So with an endpoint detection and response tool, I can, for example, if I got a detection on the network, like, hey, this reached out to a bad IP address, but all I know is that my machine reached out. I don't know what exactly reached out. So I could use the, that information about the time that it happened, go into my EDR tool, plug in that host and that time and find, or and that IP address it reached out to, and I can see what process actually initiated that connection and if it's malicious, I can sort of trace the tree of processes that like spawned this activity. And we'll, we'll see an example of this uh, towards the end of the talk, just because I think it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, the, the sum total of all of these things is that everything creates logs. And that is what we use in enterprise cybersecurity is logs. Every, the, the more logs, the better, really. And oftentimes the difficulty is retaining all of the logs and then centralizing them in one place so that when I, when I, for example, get an indicator that like, hey, there's this IP address and it's really bad. And if, if someone's reaching out to it, it means you're compromised right now. I wanna be able to just look in one place, type in, did anyone talk to this IP address? And it will let me know because it's funneling logs from everywhere in the enterprise into one place. It will let me know who's talked to it, if anyone has. So we'll, I'll, I'll talk about some more of the security information event manager. A SIM is what usually collects those logs. So we'll look a little bit deeper into that in the next section. The last piece I wanted to go into as far as principles go is the incident response lifecycle. And there are a few of these um, broken out in like different steps, but generally the process is the same. Uh, you have when incidents happen, you want to be able to follow like a set of steps that every time you complete an incident or, or just find that it wasn't bad, every time you want your security posture to improve. So the way we do that is having some simple steps um, to follow every time something bad happens. So first off, we have learn and prepare. So 
this is setting up our tools. It's, it's learning what the threats are and setting up our tools to detect those threats, et cetera, and so forth. And when those tools are working and they start generating detections, now we move into detect and report. Like, let us know that you found the thing that we're prepared to detect. And now that we have a report of it, we will go into the triage and analyze step. Um, you know, a lot of times we have to analyze just to make sure that it's actually bad um, because there is a decent amount of activity that looks bad in a lot of ways, but may not necessarily be bad. And so it's in this step where we're actually figuring that out. And as far as triage is concerned, that's if, if we have figured out that uh, compromise has occurred in any way, we have to try and lock down that machine and prevent further damage or spreading uh, across the network as quickly as possible. And then once we've done that and sort of like contained the threat, uh, lastly, we contain and recover. So, you know, in, in a lot of enterprises, if you get caught with malware on your system, they're just gonna re-image it. They're just gonna start over, <laughs> nuke the hard drive uh, because it's, even if you like clean it with antivirus, that doesn't necessarily, there's so many ways to maintain persistence on a system that oftentimes the safest bet is just to re-image because then you can be almost certain uh, <laughs> that you've gotten rid of it. There, there, there is a very nasty type of malware called a root kit that will install at a level beyond the hard drive uh, into the firmware and the hardware of your machine. That's uh, a lot harder to recover from, but also if you have what's called a BIOS password, then it makes it very difficult to do that. And once you've recovered, you have additional lessons to learn from about what to look for in your environment. If you didn't have detections, now you put those in, or you learn about ways to detect the threat you've discovered, or also you could have found out it wasn't malicious, and now we need to tune uh, the way our detection works so that we're not alerting off of traffic that isn't bad. So any security org just goes through this process consistently over and over and over again. And as they do, their security posture gets a bit better. Uh, I'm just gonna check the Q and A. All right, cool. Nobody's got one yet. Uh, so let's move on to tools and departments. So this, I'm just gonna bring up a little image here. Um, so I've drawn in the center, the crown jewels so depending on the company, this could be uh, personally identifiable information, PII, of customers, because often we're storing their address, maybe their social security number, uh, information that if they were able to get a lot of these records, they could sell them so that people can perform identity fraud. Um, so, but, the, but it could be all sorts of things. I mean, access to financial accounts, uh, accounts that you can wire to and from. Whatever it is, uh, there it is at the center. And we've got a few ways that attackers could get in. They could be reaching through the network. And in the network column, we've got uh, the firewall, which we talked about. Uh, we've got the VPN, which is a virtual private network. And basically what this allows you to do is if someone's out on the internet, you could get them to authenticate to your company first and then all of their traffic from then is actually going to your company first and then out to the internet. So oftentimes um, work laptops will actually be set up so they cannot access the internet until it is plugged into the VPN because then the company has controls over what happens. Whereas if you just let any laptop onto the internet, they could be, you, you don't know what they're doing. They're not generating some of the logs that you might be used to getting. So you might not be able to detect where something bad came from. So a virtual private network makes it as if you were inside the network by authenticating first. And then we've got DLP listed there again as another like network-based tool that we can use to either protect ourselves or uh, sort of fingerprint the evidence of bad things happening. Next up, we've got controls at the machine level. So in this case, uh, I've got a few things here. Uh, the first one I've got is asset management. And 
it plugs into the next two in the sense that like, if you don't know what's on your network, it can be very difficult to defend against threats because you may not even know what threats you have. So just knowing uh, the types of machines you have on your network and the software they have installed and the hardware, even the hardware that they have installed will, will help you stay on top of when you need to loop in the patch management team. So the patch management team a lot of times, you know, there will be a, a high severity threat that like could be exploited very easily from outside on the internet and just break in through your defenses. So sometimes a patch management team, you know, comes in on Saturday afternoon and makes sure that that gets fixed. Um, a lot of times it may be, you know, a two week cycle or a month cycle to make sure that you're applying patches and nothing in the environment is breaking. But regardless, uh, it's a very important part of an enterprise network because of how many machines you have and thus your attack surface is very large. So making sure that there's a team for that is important as well. And lastly, I have configuration management listed there. And that's just, you know, there you could have a security tool, but if it's not securely configured, you're not really utilizing the defenses of the tool. And I mean, Windows itself has so many configurations that are more or less secure, but not everything is enabled by default because you, you, you want Windows to just ship with something relatively usable by anyone. But, but a good configuration management department is instituting policies that help ensure that uh, vulnerabilities aren't introduced by the way that the network is configured. Or, you know, there could be vulnerabilities that could be leveraged once someone gets inside and you could prevent that from happening with a strong configuration management program. The last piece of uh, places where we can institute controls but also be exploited is our people. And this one is very difficult to manage. I mean, just as much as tech, uh, people are also often very helpful. Uh, you know, if, if, if your network team or your, your team doing configuration management don't have time to get to all the security things, uh, oftentimes people are, are the best way to prevent a lot of attacks. So I listed identity and access management there as well, uh, just because oftentimes instituting what's called least privilege, i.e. not giving anyone more privilege than is necessary to do their job, will prevent a sort of like if an attacker was able to gain control of something or you have an insider who's just willing to do a malicious thing, then if you have those types of controls in place that can sort of keep them inside of a certain box that you may be able to detect on as well when they come up against privileges they don't have. Uh, next up is email. And this is still the primary threat vector for all of the big hacks you've heard about in the news the number last year or two years ago was 95% of attacks start with an email. I think we're getting to like 88 or 85 this year. So it's getting a little bit better. But the reason that is, is because all these network controls we have and the controls at the machine level we have, these are designed to be secure. And what email does is if you're able to get something inside of the network, which is, you know, the email, there's a message with an attachment or what have you, and then they click on the thing and bad thing happens. And now they've installed something that reaches out to ask for their instructions. And it's like, hey, just to let you know, I just broke into some network. And then they get alerted on the other end and they start typing commands into a machine that's already inside your network. So you're bypassing this set of defenses in the middle. So email is still, and will probably likely stay the biggest threat to most enterprise organizations and even small organizations for the foreseeable future. And one of the things we can do to help with uh, email compromise is security awareness. And that's just really letting people know that there are ways that people on the internet abuse trust or fear to get you to click things. Um, a common example of a phishing email is like an invoice, like, oh, invoice is attached. It's a very short email with an attachment. You're like, oh, okay. I mean, I guess 
there, there's some level of trust involved. Like, you know, someone wouldn't just send me an invoice. So they click on the attachment and then compromise the machine or, or they pretend to be a superior. Um, this happens a lot in smaller organizations where say the VP quote unquote sends an email to accounting and is like, Hey, I need this done really quick. Wire a hundred thousand dollars to this address. And, and the, you know, the accounting person's like, Oh, don't want to upset the VP better. They said it's gotta be done quick. Better send that wire of a hundred thousand dollars into this bank account. And then, uh, yeah, a day later, that bank account doesn't work anymore and that money's gone. And this is still accounts for billions and billions of dollars lost every year. And it's really just a matter of like finding out who the VP is, finding out who accounting is, maybe make an email that looks like the VPs or there, there's ways to show a different email as what shows up in the email. If again, there's security controls to prevent this, but may not be configured. So this still happens a lot. And that's just to give you an idea of a lot of the pieces that make up an enterprise organization. And each one of those circles can have, you know, maybe just one person working that department, or it could be 15, uh, depending on the size of the organization and the complexity of their security in each tool. Or it could be one system administrator trying to do all of these things, uh, which uh, well, let's pray for them because that's a lot of work. Uh, so that's the first security organization thing I wanted to show. The next one, I wanted to show more about the security operations center, which is where um, these alerts go. This is where I actually started and where I generally point people to start uh, is in a security operations center or a SOC. And so they've got the security information event manager, a SIM, and we talked about all those logs from those various security tools that are plugging into, oh, it's not the top part. Oh, it's, there it is. So we've, we've got the various logs plugging in here. We've got event logs, which are possibly Windows event logs or Linux event logs going to the SIM. We've got the intrusion detection system. We've got endpoint detection and response. We've got our antivirus. And another great one that we use for a lot of content is our proxy. And basically the, pro the way the proxy is mostly used is to, wh when you wanna go somewhere on the internet, first you check with the proxy and the proxy is like, oh, that site has actually been categorized as bad. I won't let you go there. Or it's categorized as social media and my, they don't want to let you go there while you're at work. So they, they can categorize things and and inner, like just sort of sit in the middle of the traffic to allow or deny traffic based on categories or rules or that sort of thing. Similar to a firewall, but with more complexity um, because a firewall is just an IP addresses and ports, whereas the proxy, you can block specific sites, which is a little more information than the IP or port. So all of these things get plugged into the SIM and then they ultimately end up with alerts and so there's lots of different ways we craft these alerts based on the data coming in, but all of this ends up going to the SOC. And basically what a SOC analyst is doing is they have a queue of alerts that just sort of pile up and you just go in, start documenting what you're finding and then finding out whether it's good or bad. So you have to justify to the business why this alert showed up. And hopefully, you know, you can, you can tune the alert if it keeps showing up for a reason that is just wasting your time, you can implement some sort of change to, to make the alert not happen in that way, but still work for if the bad thing happened or the bad version of that thing happened. And then not only is there just the SOC, but then you've got all your friends in these security departments. So uh, you may have a machine learning team that is taking the security data and also taking the response of the SOC analysts like, oh, this set of security data that we have here, the SOC analyst confirmed is bad. So now when we see sort of like remnants of that sort of pattern of activity happening in other places, you know, a machine learning algorithm could get better and better at finding that type of malicious activity just off of you previously classifying something as bad. You know, it could also, if, if a SOC analyst classified something as good that was bad, 
you could actually be training the algorithm badly too. So, so the, it's just a lot of work. It's its own department, but what they're able to do with that can be pretty fascinating. Next up, we've got incident response over here. And that's not always, not every SOC has this, but it's often like an escalation team that like when something, when SOC finds something that's really, really bad and we need to do that triage and analyze contain and recover step as quickly as possible, we're looping in the incident response team. They're, they're sort of, you know, like the A team that starts digging in as quickly as possible and making sure that happens, like the company response happens as quickly as possible and not just leaving it all to one analyst because oftentimes it's a whole team starting to dig all over the network to figure out what happened as quickly as possible. And they may also loop in forensics. So forensics are often on the IR team as well, but they also may need, <clears throat> excuse me, they may need to document forensic evidence of what happened in case there is a, a breach that is so significant that you actually need to let the authorities know. Um, if you're in banking, there's a lot of like regulation about how your security program needs to work. So if you fail to do that or, or you show that with forensic evidence that you did that and they still made it through, that could sort of clear your name of wrongdoing or any sort of fines or, or audit findings that force you to level up your security posture. And then you may also have a malware team, although they're usually called reverse engineers because they take the malware if they find it. You know, you actually have an executable that did bad things. They can dig into it and start peeling off the layers like and it's not easy to do. It's not meant to just be exposed um, so they can start digging into it and finding uh, information within the malware that you could then search across your organization and make sure there's no none of those indicators that are inside this malware anywhere else inside your network. And lastly, I've got threat intelligence there as well. And they may be doing what the malware team is doing as well. But threat intelligence can be a lot of things. It can be gathering indicators of compromise, IOCs off the internet of like new attacks. Like let's say there's this hash that's bad. So let's make sure we don't have this hash in our environment. There's these IP addresses or domains that are bad. Let's search and make sure we don't have those. Or a lot of my friends in threat intelligence are learning Russian or Chinese because they're going onto the forums where some of these tools are sold, some of these credentials are sold, that kind of thing on the dark web. So they, you know, they participate in those communities. So they have some sort of street cred and can, you know, monitor what's going on. What are the attackers generally talking about? Have they mentioned our company name, like by name as like having access to our network, that kind of thing. So those are just some pieces of the security organization. What I love about security is like, you know, I started as a SOC analyst, which is kind of a generalist. And now at this point I'm an engineer. So I'm, I'm helping build the content that become alerts. Um, but there's so many other pathways to go. Like I, I wanted to go the threat intelligence route when I first started, um, just cause I always thought it was so cool. Like there's this like geopolitical intrigue going on where like the United States, Russia and China, we're all hacking each other all the time. It's a, uh, I don't think that's a surprise, but nobody admits to it. It's just sort of like one of those things that's, that's definitely happening. And uh, I always thought that was interesting and wanted to know more, but I articles and uh, stumble into that, that realm of security every once in a while. Um, so that's all I had for tools and departments. Just wanna make sure, I don't think there's any Q&A. So next up, we've got the security operations team. So this is just going over the names of some of the tools and how they work um, and how we utilize them in an enterprise. So the first one that I've mentioned a few times now is the SIM. The one I'm most familiar with and I have drank the Kool-Aid for is Splunk. You can actually go to, uh, if you Google for Splunk security project, you will find a little sign up sheet that you fill that in and they'll give you access to an instance of Splunk that has a bunch of logs in it and has like a, an a actual attack, like data in the logs that indicates an attack occurred. So you can, you can sort of follow this walkthrough that's in the Splunk instance to sort of see that, 
oh, there was an IP address pinging, uh, I'm really not Batman.com, like hundreds of thousands of times. And then you dig a little bit deeper in another set of logs and you see that like, oh, they were trying passwords. You know, they weren't just pinging, they were hitting hitting our server with passwords until they got in. And then you could see, oh, they got in with this password at this time. And then you can see what they start doing after that. It's really cool. Um, it's a great introduction to what we do as far as a blue team is concerned. Less about the hacking and more about the defending. But some other ones are ArcSight, which has been around for a long time, and QRadar. Again, you can look up Sims, but uh, most of them are sort of paid products. However, if you look for a Linux distribution called Security Onion, it will have, uh, it has a SIM tool, it has EDR, it has antivirus intrusion detection system. And if you play around with Security Onion, you could make like an enterprise level uh, security architecture setup, which can be really fun and is how I learned the most before I got an actual job. Because I, I knew how to actually like, I could attack myself and then, and then just attack myself. But then I crafted something to the SIM so that when I perform that attack again, it sent an alert to the SIM. And now I got an alert in the SIM like, hey, you've been attacked. So you can sort of build up that uh, security architecture within your own network at home and learn a lot more about it. Uh, next up are some endpoint detection and response tools. Two of the biggest players in the game, actually all three are now really big players in the game, is Carbon Black Response, CrowdStrike, and Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection. And even if you have a Windows machine, you probably don't have Microsoft ATP. But all of these do what I showed earlier of the, the process tree. So you could, uh, and again, Security Onion has an open source EDR called Wazoo. So you could set up Wazoo to forward logs into your Security Onion SIM and then witness sort of the, the actual events happening on your machine or other machines in your network. Anything you install the agent on can send logs so you can create detections off of more granular data at the process level. So you can see if it's modifying the registry or creating a network connection or creating a file or spawning other processes. So like a, a very simple one that last year I was able to show, I, I don't have an EDR tool set up today, but the last one I did was <clears throat> um, like an office suite, like a word document typing suite, spawning a command shell, which is like uh, this when you type CMD, like this, this is a, this is a command shell. So why is an office product spawning this? Like that shouldn't be happening in most cases. So that's like a simple EDR detection you could start with is, is that sort of detection? And, or you could make it when you ping badplace.ru so that, you know, if it sees a network connection to an RU domain, let me know. So there's a lot of things you can do with EDR if you set it up, it be really fun. And then lastly, I just wanted to show off some malware sandboxes. Okay, I do have a little bit of time. I guess we won't have time for stories, but I'll check for questions. And then if there's time, uh, we'll go over some stories. But uh, a sandbox is sort of does some of the peeling for you, but basically it's just letting the malware explode and monitoring what happens. Rather than like peeling off the layers of the malware manually, it's making the malware run and then seeing what it does. So something really cool, um, any.run is probably my favorite, um, is probably my favorite malware sandbox because what it's basically doing is running an EDR tool while a malware explodes. So for example, this is the ransomware WannaCry. So it starts, I'm gonna refresh. Oh, there it goes, okay. So it starts here, just a regular Windows machine, but then Oh, a file opens. I can't figure out how to open it. Oh, I'm going to try this. Oh, notepad opens and starts telling you your files are encrypted. And then next, eventually it logs onto Firefox and now your important files are encrypted. And now you have an encrypted machine and it tells you like, hey, here's how you send Bitcoin to this address to get your files decrypted. But the whole time this is happening, it's monitoring on the side here, like an EDR tool, um, 
see WannaCry ran. You can see the commands it's running here. It ran a bat script here and then a Visual Basic script here. Uh, and yeah, you can sort of watch the tree of information. Here's the actual encryption process right here is VSSS admin delete shadows. Uh, a shadow is sort of like a, a, a copy of your files that you could access uh, sometimes in safe mode, but the first thing it does is disables access to the shadow copy and then deletes the shadows and then, uh, yeah, makes it impossible to go into recovery mode. So any doubt run is if you get a live piece of malware, you can throw it into there and witness what happens. Um, another one that I had listed there was in Tether. And the cool thing about Intezer is it it's breaking apart the malware and identifying the code samples and the families of code, like the genetics of the malware, because a lot of malware is basically based off of previous malware and just adding a few new features here and there. So this WannaCry example also has 5% of it um, looks like the Lazarus malware family. And then it also lists well, malicious library, which is rather, rather generic. But uh, again, it can it can break down a piece of malware and give you an idea of sort of where it came out of or its progenitors or ancestors before it got to you. So those are two of my favorite malware sandboxes. There's another open source one called Cuckoo, which you can install yourself on a home network. So Looks like, I mean, we started about 10 minutes after the hour, so I just wanted to open it up for questions. Now, I do have some recent stories that I find interesting that I can more than happy to ramble about, but I just wanted to check in and see if anyone had any questions. All right. Well, I don't see any popping up. So it sounds like you really want to listen to me ramble about some recent security stories. Um, oh, I see one. All right. How did you know you liked cybersecurity? I'm so glad you asked this because I didn't know at all. Um, so I used to be an animator. I used to draw cartoons. Really. Great as that is, I, I'm glad that I drew cartoons for a living for a little while, because that is what I knew I liked to do was draw. But I was working 60 to 80 hour weeks for four years of my life, and I burnt out very, very hard and knew that I didn't want to work. Uh, I didn't want to work doing what I loved. Um, so I, while I was working as a receptionist and not making very much money, I was you know, like, well, geez, what do I do now? I, I didn't have a career. I didn't really have any prospects or ideas of what I wanted to do. But I talked to a friend of mine that was had gotten into cybersecurity after working in IT for a few years. And he was like, oh, you should do cybersecurity. And I'm like, oh, really? Your, your hippie artist friend can do cybersecurity? And he's like, well, I mean, the starting pay is $80,000 a year, which is more money than I've ever made in my life. And I was like, okay, I am starting to learn how to do that tomorrow. And uh, over the course of a year and a half, he mentored me every week. We would just meet on Skype and sort of talk about cybersecurity things. But, you know, af a few weeks in, like, I realized that I really, it's fascinating. There's, there, there's, there is a lot of the stuff that is sort of just like book learning and it's sort of just like, oh, it feels like you're sort of just rote memorization. But then when you're actually doing the thing, I, I found that was really fascinating. And I mentioned before that I was really into threat intelligence, which I, what, what started it was reading this book, Spam Nation by Brian Krebs, where he talks about actual like criminal gangs like Yakuza and, uh, you know, like terrorist organizations utilizing spam email to make money off the internet. And so that sort of like lit my interest in like, oh, that's really fascinating. So I think finding something you really like about the industry uh, can be a good starting point to, to sort of make you want to learn more. Um, but yeah, once I started doing things, I just, I just found lots of fun things to do and kept doing it. So, you know, initially uh, I was purely money motivated, uh, but that's also not a bad reason, I don't think. You know, it's it's it can be difficult to survive and you know care for your family and have the have the money to 
care for your family. So now, now I make the kind of money that, you know, I can care for myself and the people I care about. So I feel very lucky. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that question, Robinson. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it open for a moment so I don't just break into rambling, but uh, I'm, I'm also excited about the, the rambling part too, because the, there's some really fascinating things that happened um, just in the past few years that uh, will be in the cybersecurity history books um, if you haven't already heard about them. Uh, how is the work-life balance? And then you'll let me ramble. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's another really good question. And I think it really depends on who you ask because depending on the, you know, just the work environment and how people have let it happen there up until that point, some friends and I never want to do that. I think a lot of it is also coming to work with boundaries that you don't let uh, your employer break. Because if, if they're paying you for salary, for example, that should be 40 hours a week. But if they're expecting 60 hours out of you every week, just because your coworkers are working 60 hours a week, I, you know, that's not a good work-life balance. So, you know, what, when I started working where I do now, I was very clear that that's, I work my 40 hours. I have a shift and I work that shift. And, uh, you know, sure, I'll stay on an extra hour or two if something big is happening. It's not like I'm just, you know, I just have a permanent boundary there. But I made it clear to my employer and my employer also the environment wasn't one of those places where people were putting in 50 hour weeks, 60 hour weeks. So it really depends on the place and also the, the set of boundaries that you come into the place of work with. So, so definitely do that because, uh, yeah, burning out as an animator. I mean, I, I was broken for a few years. You know, I didn't want to learn anything. I didn't want to do anything. And uh, it can be dangerous to sort of set the example that like, oh, yeah, I work 50 hours a week. And well, then they expect you to work 50 hours every week. Uh, so I would just say move into it with with a strong sense of purpose and a strong sense of boundaries. And you'll you'll, you'll probably be fine wherever you end up. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it looks like nobody answered any other, or uh, asked any other questions. So I just wanted to mention three really cool instances, and we have about 10 minutes, so I'll try, hmm, I'll try to briefly talk about each one. So the first one is, I mentioned earlier, uh, I looked at a malware sample of WannaCry, which was, so it started with, a group called the Shadow Brokers, they found a set of tools on one of their servers that matched with the names of tools that Edward Snowden, the, the US sort of intelligence agency whistleblower who now lives in Russia, he released documents sort of showing how the American government was monitoring its own citizens because he felt it was unethical. And he had like he had released some some PDFs of like names of tools that do X Y Z, and Shadow Brokers found a server with all of these tools on it, like just you know the file. So because the way the NSA probably attacks someone is to install all those tools, run them all, and then delete the tool set, but they just didn't didn't delete it or didn't catch it in time. So Shadow Brokers released the tool set. And part of it was to make the U.S. look bad, was because some of these these exploits were were on products made by U.S. companies. So, for example, there was a exploit in the SMB protocol, which is a file sharing protocol on Windows networks, and this exploit let you remotely execute code. So, you with another exploit, you could move a file, like let's say you were on the you were on the accounting machine. With this exploit, you could move a file to another machine and then execute it on the machine, which shouldn't like that shouldn't be happening. So what this ransomware WannaCry allowed it to do was like it would infect a network and then just whatever systems it had access to, it would throw itself all over all over the network and detonate everything. So everything would get locked up. And so this actually 
almost brought down the, the UK's National Health Service because uh, it just was able to propagate over their networks. And thankfully, this lovely human uh, whose Twitter is malware tech, he found that there was a domain in the malware that it looked like it reached out to that domain first, and then it would run the malware. But it, it's very strange. This isn't very common, but it's a kill switch. And so when he registered the domain, like made it actually reach something, that prevented the malware from executing. Because it's like, oh, the domain exists. I'm not going to execute. Not entirely sure why they did this. It might have been an unfamiliarity with uh, how to run a ransomware scam. It seemed like they weren't that interested in actually collecting payments. Uh, it might, and they've traced it. It has a lot of fingerprints. Again, in cybersecurity, we can never say with 100% certainty, but 90 to 98, <laughs> it's pretty good that this was by North Korea's um, team. So it may have just been to make make Western countries look bad, uh, but they didn't seem. Uh, ransomware nowadays is like you get better customer service with a ransomware group than you often do calling your, your internet provider because they want your money and you want your files decrypted. So they, they have like chat agents, they have like instructions and they're like, oh, here's how we broke in just so you can fix it. So nobody else does this to you again. It's a very customer service friendly industry at this point. And, and it was starting to become that way around the time of WannaCry, but WannaCry was not like that at all. So there's a wired.com article all about WannaCry and malware tech, uh, the, the, the person who found that domain. And it's a fascinating story. It probably takes about an hour to read. It's a very long form article, but that was one that was just, uh, I believe 2018, um, something that happened last year, or at least we found out in December of 2020 was the solar winds breach and so what SolarWinds is, it's an, uh, I, meant, I mentioned in that little machines corner, asset management. SolarWinds is a tool that helps you manage your assets and know what you have on your network and that sort of thing. And the dangerous thing about that is that often these types of tools have very high privileges so that they can just scan the network and do all these, you know, they can reach into computers and find out what's on them and do all sorts of stuff that like, if it, if it wasn't solar winds, then it's probably really bad. And that's what the case was. So in 2020, a, a group called FireEye, who actually released the first report of, about uh, what we call advanced persistent threats, uh, APTs. So Russia has APTs, China has APTs, uh, Iran has APTs, the United States has APTs, it's basically anything that is funded, well-funded and well-organized, so advanced and persistent and a threat. So FireEye is one of, one of the original companies that started releasing reports about APTs, and they discovered this SolarWinds breach by seeing strange activity by their SolarWinds instance. And I mean, I could go into the complexities. I actually was on a podcast for Executive Women's Forum describing some of the technical detail. But what they did was they actually found out just like a few weeks ago that they initially compromised SolarWinds infrastructure. So this attack happened December, 2020. They were in SolarWinds network, possibly mid 2019. So they were there for a long time doing a lot of reconnaissance and building a, a malicious update to the SolarWinds product they got pushed in March of 2020. So when that got pushed to customers, this gave access to that APT group to all of SolarWinds customers. So it was basically like getting a built-in backdoor into the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, Microsoft, uh, a bunch of other Fortune 100 companies. And they sort of just had free reign from the inside. I mean, obviously those teams could maybe detect things or with IAM, they might be protecting the, the right things in a way that their access didn't allow them to reach it. But that's a, a massive attack. And we, we still, because we don't necessarily have fingerprints of what they did, we still not sure what they learned from access to lots, lots of these companies, as well as to a bunch of government institutions. So yeah, that one's going in the history books. And um, the last one I'll mention real quick is if you look it up, it's called Kaseya. K-A-S-E-Y-A. 
And again, this is when you compromise a product that is used in a lot of environments, it's called a supply chain attack because you're, you're, you're compromising something in the supply chain and now you're gaining access to everything that uses that product. So again, Kaseya well, was compromised and reached, uh, I believe this is a point of sale service system. And then it allowed this ransomware group to distribute ransomware to anyone using that point of sale system. So millions and millions of customers or, or machines locked down, encrypted. Uh, the Kaseya ransomware group said, actually released something shortly after their successful project. Like, hey, if you want us to just decrypt everything, please send us, uh, I think, 75 million in Bitcoin. It might have been billion. It was, it was a large, large number. They asked for, I think it might have been like billion. But they asked like, hey, if you want to decrypt everything, we'll be fine with, with $75 billion. Oh, which is pretty wild. But uh, you know what's interesting about this evolution of ransomware is again they're trying to do supply chain tax attacks more often because it can be so lucrative. But also, they not only did they do like ransomware as a service, you know, with the chat and and all that sort of thing. They also had like pen testers, which you know in in our world on on the the quote unquote good guys and gals side, uh, a, a pen tester tests your defense defenses to find out where the holes are and then like let you know how to fix them. But now ransomware groups are finding it much more lucrative to not just get in your network and be like, okay, uh, I don't know, let's charge them 10 grand. They've got like a hundred computers on the network. They can probably afford 10 grand. Let's do ransomware everything, ask for 10 grand. Now they're compromising networks and then handing it over, handing the control over to a pen test team, which starts breaking into the environment, doing a ton of reconnaissance, finding out the financials of these companies, so they can be like, "Oh, this company makes ten million a year. Yeah, they probably pay five million for their files." Yeah, so, they, so they're they're able to do this sort of reconnaissance, figure out how much they could possibly charge, and then something they also do now is uh, blackmail, where they find information within the company. Uh, for example, oh goodness, there was a video game company that got uh, breached recently and they were like, oh, we're going to publish the source code. Maybe it was Battlefield, Battlefield 2, but they broke into the company, found the source code for the game engine, which is, you know, proprietary code. And uh, they're like, if you don't pay the ransom, we're going to release this code on the internet. So that got released because they, I don't think they paid the ransom. They just restored from backups, which thankfully they probably they did have. But again, these ransomware groups are evolving, like their, their tactics and their procedures are getting better and they're working together now to do more damage so that they can ask for more money. So they're actually sort of like becoming little companies. Uh, we're even seeing like venture capital firms, like ransomware groups being like, hey, we wanna hire more people. So like, are you a talented malware developer? join our team. We've got benefits. You get profit sharing. You know, it's basically working for a company. So we're seeing that happening in the space right now with Kaseya and the, and the group that uh, started the attack. So again, that's the kind of stuff I find really interesting. And uh, yeah, that's, that's not the end. There's more to come. So I just wanted to mention all those fun things because I think it's really cool. And uh, I hope you do too. And uh, that's all I've got. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, my website is the number 7thdrxn.com, 7thdirection.com, seven letters. Or you can e email me. My last name is Mills. And that's Mills, L-E-Y, Millsley at gmail.com. If you want to uh, just chat about where you're at and what you're trying to do. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm an open book, so. Thank you all for joining. Alper, thank, thank you for hosting. And uh, yeah, any questions before we wrap up?